Welcome to the October 28th pre-Halloween festivities of the Hadley School Committee uh, meeting. Is there a motion to call <coughs> to order? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Here we go. Uh, adjustments to the agenda. There are two that I had. One is we're going to add to the business manager report. Um, we're going to come back to the discussion we started last meeting about warrant approval and um, having one approver electronically but access for all of us electronically uh, just in the interest of keeping those um, AP uh, and payroll warrants moving forward uh, so we'll add that to topic six and we'd also like to move topic four personnel report to occur after 3e so after the curriculum and special education goals we'll cover that great any other adjustments to the agenda and it looks like um, we were going to have some students from GSA here t this evening. Um, you do have some information in your packet that I'll speak to, but the students aren't here this evening. So, um, do we know if they're coming? Should we postpone that, or should we go ahead and tackle that topic first? Uh, why don't we postpone it in case they do show up? Let's do that okay. as an adjustment. Okay. So we'll hold on 3A until Let's see if the students are available. Sure. Okay. <coughs> I know there's a soccer game, I believe, that maybe mm -hmm. that could be it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Then we will start with 3B, the student representative report. And that is Mr. Kelly and Ms. Markowski. Okay. Um, so I guess you want to talk about uh, the last meeting of, I guess, the environmental group. Um, so we had a meeting on Friday, or on Thursday, and um, not as many people attended as I would have liked, especially people that said they would attend. Um, I think I can probably pull them back in at some point. But we mainly discussed our goals and what we would like to achieve. Um, we came up with a few options, but I'm not sure I should share them until we have fully explored them and fully mm -hmm. created a plan for how we want to implement them and how we want to go about achieving them. Um, but we did have a good discussion about our goals um, and what we personally think we could do to better the school. Jack, can I ask, are these students exclusively from student council or were there also, how did you invite students? I'm just curious um, who's interested. After, uh, it was partially the group that I that had participated in the walkout with me mm -hmm. and um, it, the other part was students <coughs> who had emailed me after the walkout and had expressed interest. Um, Two of them are in student council, uh, Virginia Canella and Marley Higgins, um, but Avery Lapis is not, and most of the other people who did not show up are not. Thank you. When do you um, anticipate your next meeting, or what are you trying to get them together again? Um, I believe you'd suggested bi-weekly meetings, um, which I think is good, because that gives us some time to prepare stuff yeah. to talk about, and at some point we were considering an after school meeting to maybe make posters or have an extended period of time to discuss things because the lunch period doesn't really give us a lot. So before we cover the, the grant, and that's mm -hmm. exciting to hear about, can you just frame um, kind of what the, the purpose or mission of this group that you're, you're helping to convene would be? So this group, which I, the title hasn't really been defined yet because I'm not even sure the proper qualifications for a club. Um, it's a group of students who are interested in making Hopkins an environmentally friendlier place and making students more aware of the impact their actions have on the environment. Um, and that's a complicated issue and we wouldn't want to, um, I guess, be hypocritical with saying students shouldn't be doing certain things if we ourselves are also doing them. So um, we just have to make sure anything that we propose wouldn't it, could, it couldn't possibly backfire on us, mm -hmm. or couldn't, it's, it's foolproof, basically. Mm -hmm. um, it, the end goal would just be to make Hopkins an environmentally friendlier place through a variety of means. So when you say environment, because that may be perceived in a number of different ways, and I know, um, Annie, you've talked about some of the Hadley Elementary School initiatives in mm -hmm. terms of, of, like, environmentally friendly, you know, <clears throat> don't use straws and recycling. Mm -hmm. So there's that aspect of environment and then there's like social emotional environment and your <coughs> your surroundings and kind of your you know mm -hmm. the 
the feeling that you get when you come into school. Can you talk a little bit about the distinction, if any, you're making between those two? Um, it's more sort of the environment, meaning the natural world, so mm -hmm. Hopkins carbon footprint and reducing the, the amount of waste produced by the school. Mm -hmm. um, that side of it, not really the social side of it, although we could at some point discuss that option too. Now it sounds it sounds like there's also interest in the elementary school level, so it would be interesting to hear how maybe those both Hopkins and the elementary school might be able to mm -hmm. um, convene on this very specific but important topic that mm -hmm. I think is shared uh, a shared concern across both buildings. Can I offer some advice? Um, don't worry about having a bulletproof plan. Don't worry about uh, things being 100% perfect because this is a learning opportunity for you and your peers. You should think about what multiple experiments look like that might change people's behavior and help reduce the carbon footprint. Um, you might run them as little experiments. Let's try a week without like making well, making sure that as many lights are off as possible. Or let's try a week of all bringing Tupperware to collect food. Or try try things and see what sticks rather than knowing because you don't know what's going to work. Um, you, all you know is what you can try and see how people like that. That's that's what I would recommend. I think it's a great idea. You guys could do an uh, energy audit. <coughs> you know, a lot of the power that we've used the electricity here is solar. Um, so you can you know, get, get an assessment of how much energy this place consumes. Um, if you initiate some activities, you can do a month to month analysis and see if you can make you know, what change is happening. It'd be pretty cool. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to hearing from you over the next, um, you know, in the future as we come together. And uh, I do, I do encourage you to see what leverage you may have with being able to involve um, other classes. We certainly appreciate your support. Great. So, Allison, you had some information on the grant. So, I'm doing independent study with Dr. McKenzie right now, and I think our big goal is this Cooler Communities Expo. The Cooler Communities is a nonprofit organization, and they have like an it's an advocacy program that targets five big environmental issues, which are reducing waste, adapting a lower carbon diet, educating the community on steps taken to become more energy efficient, choosing clean cleaner energy and reducing carbon emissions like related to transportation and that sort. So we want to try to adapt these goals as we could through the school and through grants that we had just gotten from the representative. We met with a representative two weeks ago mm -hmm. this, and she's sort of introduced us to what taking this on would be and what the, the goal and what she sees us doing in our first year with this. By writing the grants, if we're granted them, we get, I'm not sure how much money it is. Did you say it was like <coughs> 2000 2500 enough money to support yeah. the, put so, them on an expo. So if we get this expensive. grant, we want to initiate an expo called the Cooler Communities Expo. We're thinking it would be at some point in May, probably on a Friday evening. It would be an hour and a half, two hours, I think we decided on. And it would be sort of set up like a science fair. It's different little stands and projects that are targeting these different goals that they had and we were seeing maybe the environmental club could do some see if maybe some seventh graders doing their science fair projects wanted to do them see even if the um, elementary schoolers wanted to do them on their straws that kind of thing so it like includes everybody in the district and for each project they said they'd grant us $150 so we're getting money through that and we'd like to make it like a big thing where we have we were talking about getting like food or like music or entertainment, so it's like an event for people to come to. And our target right now is to have 200 people to come. And there's different things we can do within the school and integrate these like just environmental knowledge within the students, like the student community, to have them become more knowledgeable on the topic. So we have different things like, oh, write a letter to your parents about how you think you guys could become more environmentally sustainable within your household. And this kind of thing, that, that would be targeted for more of the middle schoolers, but we were given these packets that provided information that was better explaining what we could do to target all of these 
throughout elementary school through senior year. So we could do this kind of thing which could help the students become more into it. And we were thinking make a social media platform, just try to market it really well so people got into it because we're hoping to make this a yearly thing. I know I'll only be here this year and next year, but hopefully somebody will like be interested in carrying it on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Part of you did a great job on Ali, part of what happens. So other communities have done these expo expos. There are a limited number of school districts that are selected to do this. Part of this is through support from the Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts provides support for this. Agamon has done this now for a couple of years and has really enjoyed it. A lot of times there's a connection made, so Allie will be reaching out as part of her independent study to the town administrator and to the select board because they're looking for town engagement. It's not just about school projects. And the goal is to have people come and, and make pledges, no matter how small, to either educate themselves, to learn more about how they might do any of these things. As Ali pointed out, there's kind of five big priorities. Um, one of them I just mentioned, which I think would resonate in this community, reducing our carbon footprint when it comes to diet. That doesn't mean everybody turns into a vegetarian. That means sometimes eating locally, right? So, but that's a way to reduce one's um, carbon footprint with one's diet. So um, getting an entire community or as many people as possible to come through and to start thinking about what they might do to improve their energy habits and um, and make commitments no matter how small to do them. So what I'm very excited about, I'm excited about the leadership from both these students and from their peers. We've talked about, um, just so this connects to a bigger picture, we've talked about how as a district we really have this priority of thinking about how do we make learning meaningful and relevant and ensure that there is student voice in learning. So these are priorities that are really important to the students. Um, and we're all excited that they are capable and willing to exercise so much leadership around this. And as you all know, I'm really excited to have an assistant grant writer now in the district. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get us our first grant shortly. Um, so I'm just thrilled with what Jack and Allie and their peers are interested in doing, especially because this is their priority. It's student-led. It's what matters to them. So great yeah. commendable. I would uh, suggest that um, if we're lucky enough to get this funding to hold this expo, that we think strategically about other things that may be happening um, on the grounds or around that time frame so as to draw the biggest audience possible so that we're trying to reach out people who are conscientious about our global footprint, our Hadley footprint but also those who are not conscientious whom we might be able to activate by exposing them to your energy and your ideas. Yeah, some things that came immediately to mind were thinking about, you know, the career day idea of whether, you know, I, I'm not sure what careers are being represented this week, but in the future that that's also an area that you'd want somebody who's, who's in that field speaking to, to students, that would be incredible. Um, and then, you know, even things as simple as like our, the recycling day that the Mother's Club puts on where, you know, connecting that to why is it important? It's not just I got to unload this old dehumidifier from my basement. It's like, well, why is it important to try to um, dispose of these things in the right way? And, and what's the consequence if you don't? So things like that that I think you do have some support in locally that may uh, be a good connection. Thank you. All right, great, thanks. All right, yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Alice. Nice We're going to move on to district and school accountability data. And no, I will Lots not be data. taking you through every one of these slides. I hear you, Jack, and totally said, thank Pretty goodness. You probably opened that packet and thought, are you kidding me? Um, so. <laughs> so uh, we are required, actually, annually, the school, the school committee is required to review their accountability data 
the federal government requires that all school districts issue a report card, and we share that report card with families. That's a requirement, too, so that the school committee, we present these data to the school <coughs> committee every year, and then we send home uh, a report card in a month or two, and uh, we post it to the website. So, again, I want to remind people that we're not just looking at this data <coughs> just for the sake of looking at data. We're committed to ensuring that all students have what we define as deep learning experiences, and as a bare minimum for that, that means that we have in place a curriculum that is rigorous, aligned to state standards, and coherent. And one of the reasons we go through these data is to ask ourselves, is there anything in the data that's indicating to us that our curriculum might not be aligned to state standards in a way that's benefiting students. So do we see trends or do we see anything that jumps out that makes us say, hmm, is this something we should look at? And the reason that I provided you with even more data than usual is was simply to give you an example of something that April Camuso in her role as English department chair at Hopkins, her department sat down and looked at some of the data that you see included in this packet and, and we're asking questions about wow, you know, what, what happened this year with English language arts data in the district? What happened? And they noticed something, and I so on purpose included all of these additional slides, and I'm just going to share with you what they noticed, so we're not going to go through every single line. Thank goodness this one is like, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> so just in general, um, what did we see this year from last year? So some very good news at um, Hopkins Academy. Whereas last year, out of 12 possible points, so just a quick reminder on accountability points, you get points for achievement, you get points for growth as a high school, you get additional points for indicators such as graduation rate, dropout rate, re-engagement, advanced coursework. But the big, the common pieces are achievement, growth, and attendance. Interesting one, that attendance indicator the feds, when they redid NCLB, the federal government said you can pick, they get, you can pick just about any other um, criteria for evaluating uh, the, the effectiveness of your curriculum, of your school, and, or of your district. And the state of Massachusetts, as our commissioner says, could have chosen access to arts education, could have chosen a lot of things, and they chose attendance, which is really <laughs> It makes your soul sing, doesn't it? Uh, so that's our indicator, is attendance. Um, and so what we saw at Hopkins last year, we actually did not see, and there's, for each one of the indicators, it's zero through four points. So pretty much, so zero means you declined. One means you stayed the same in terms of your aggregate. Two means you improved, but you didn't meet the target they set. Three, you met your target. Four, you exceeded your target. So two, three, and four, you got better. One, you stayed the same. Zero, you declined. And last year, the middle school, we saw a decline in all achievement. And that changed drastically this year, which is why last year, our middle school only earned 12% of possible accountability points. And this year, they earned 70% of their points. So there was significant progress at the elementary school, or particularly in achievement. Um, and there was uh, the high school performed well last year and just changed by 2% this year, so stayed essentially the same. Um, and uh, so huge improvement from, what, from last year to this year. Remember, you're really comparing unlike cohorts, but still a huge improvement. And we saw an increase in the percentage of students completing what are considered advanced coursework by the state. So AP, certain honors courses. So we saw an increase in that. <coughs> so that gives an increase in accountability points. At Hadley Elementary School, in terms of achieving our accountability points, we saw a significant decline. And that decline, oddly, is, and this is where it was so helpful to hear the English departments, some of the analysis they did around the data across the district. What was interesting is that decline came in English language arts. And we are doing so much with tiered interventions in English language arts. So cliffhanger, wait till the end of the presentation. And you're like, Why? Da -da -da -da. See, it is exciting. Really. Never said it once. <laughs> <laughs> so 
also, uh, our participation rates continue to remain high. That's important. You automatically will find yourself in um, an accountability nightmare if your participation dips below 95%. You're automatically then determined to be a district in need of, uh, in need of assistance from the state. So the images that you see, the first one uh, had the elementary school, the ELA data from 2017 to 19. That's just showing you, and these are unlike cohorts, right? It's a different group of students in every year. And for the most part, we saw this, things didn't go so well between 18 and 19 for grade 6. But in some other cases in grade 4, we saw things change. Otherwise, things kind of stay the same. Because keep in mind our percentages, our groups are very, very small. So 10%, we'll be talking three students at max, four students maybe, we're not talking <coughs> a lot of students. So it's, it hasn't changed drastically. We did see that blip in sixth grade um, last year. But we also looked at cohort performance, which we think is more important, is when you start looking at the same students over time. So when you look at that cohort slide, what you're looking at there are students who have taken all tests at Hadley Elementary School. So these are our students, the same group of students in grade three, in grade four, grade five, grade six. You can't compare legacy MCAS, old MCAS, and new MCAS, so you only see next generation MCAS here. And what we want to see is the purple and the green get larger, because that's exceeding and meeting expectations. And you can see for that cohort in ELA <coughs> that we're absolutely going in the right direction, right? So that is something that we want to pay attention to. The, account, the overall report card compares last year's students in particular grade to this year's student, and we think it's important to pay attention to how cohorts perform over time. When we look at Hopkins Academy in English, uh, again, we see in, in eighth grade performance, um, in terms of exceeding and meeting, that stayed roughly the same, but we saw an increase in not meeting, whereas um, we saw a decrease in those students not meeting in grade seven. Again, when you look at unlike cohorts. Our cohort performance, it doesn't have the same in ELA at Hopkins. We don't see the same picture that we see at Hadley Elementary School. Um, it's not drastically different, but we really want to see that green and purple bar get larger and not decrease. When we look at math, again, um, things from year to year, they're not these kind of massive, massive spikes or trends. So what we'd be doing with these data is trying to say, are we seeing something in a particular grade that would indicate to us that the curriculum isn't aligned? Because we're constantly seeing unlike cohorts performing worse and worse over time. Or did one group perform very badly in one particular year? And then we want to say, did we change something with the curriculum? Did we do something radically different? that may have contributed to that. We're asking questions here. We don't use these data. I mean, we can identify students who might be in need of additional support, but we use these data really more to ask questions about the curriculum and curriculum alignment. When we look at the cohort performance in math at Hadley Elementary School, um, that's, a, that's a really promising picture. Again, students who've taken all their tests here, they've been our students for the last three years. So there's no churn in this. and. Um, we're absolutely trending in the right direction. When we look at Hopkins Academy in terms of year to year, um, eighth grade last year, that cohort um, didn't perform as well as the previous eighth grade cohort. Um, and the overall, in the following slide, cohort <coughs> performance, here's where we're going, our trend line is going in the opposite direction of where we want it to be. And so you'll hear in presentations this evening how we're kind of doubling our efforts to try to figure out what's contributing to this and what we can do differently to try to address it. Um, when you look at how we can comp uh, perform compared to the state, it's either similar or better in most cases. Um, we're right at the state or performing slightly better than the state when you look at your Hadley Elementary data. Um, and similarly, um, when you look at your Hopkins data, except when you start looking at grade 10, we have consistently outperformed the state um, when it comes to uh, grade 10 um, ELA and mathematics, you'll see in both charts. And again, the next slides show our state performance 
at the elementary, the following slides, at, at Hopkins Academy in mathematics, our performance compared to the state. In some cases, it's about the same, although you can see um, certainly in grade five, we did better than the state. But I keep my attention on that meeting and exceeding the green and purple part of it. And for the most part, we're right around where the state is in grade four. We did, uh, we did better than the state by a good 10%. In Hopkins Academy, again, some we are we are not where we want to be when you compare us to the state. Certainly, last year in eighth grade, I've already identified that we saw some issues in eighth grade across the board, um, but we do consistently perform better than the state in grade ten. Um, in science, our fifth graders outperform the state, and our eighth graders, our performance was equal to the state performance and much better than the previous year, um, which also contributed to the big increase in the overall accountability rating for Hopkins Academy. It was really where the middle school picked up um, improvements in accountability. And as I said to you when we were talking about, so what contributed to this overall kind of drop in performance in terms of accountability points for Hadley Elementary, and it really was on a decline. So as soon as you decline from your average score, so that scaled score, take all your students' scaled scores divided by the number of students, get your average scale score, and if your average scaled score declines by more than I think you're allowed 1.25 of a change. If it's greater than 1.25, it's considered a decline, and then it's automatically zero. Um, and so we saw that decline. In most other subjects, whether it was uh, at Hadley Elementary School or um, at Hopkins Academy, we see that um, in terms of achievement that we met our targets or exceeded our targets. And these data are taken directly from the school and district profiles that are found on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's webpage and the public, those are available to the public. So anyone can see these data if they go on school and district profiles, click on the map, for Hampshire County, click on Hadley. You can look at it by district or by school, and you can look at all the detail of the data. Um, and you can see finally in this our growth. Um, what we see is in English language arts, we still have what's considered moderate growth, 40 to 60 points in growth percentiles considered moderate. So we see moderate growth, high moderate growth at the high school in ELA. In math at Hadley Elementary School, we see high growth, and at the high school, very high growth, which also helps the accountability that takes in. When I say high school, it's, it's hot. Oh, no, I'm sorry, there's straight high school. So very high growth at the high school, very low growth in the middle school in mathematics. And that question of, so how can this be? Uh, we can't possibly be on the wrong track, and we're not on the wrong track, material interventions and supports. But one, if we do see a considerable amount of growth and improvement when we look at our FAST data. FAST assessments are focused on teaching, assessing reading. And MCAS isn't assessing necessarily foundational reading skills, skills, literacy skills. So it is assessing things like comprehension. Um, and you can see when you look at the slides that you have that have item descriptions in them. You have several slides that take each item and show you an ELA by grade. They show you how our school did, our average points, what the state did, where we were above or below the state in terms of performance. So for example, um, providing examples of figurative language, determining what a phrase from a passage suggests about a character, these are not skills that we would be assessing with FAST in K through six. We would really be looking at reading skills like fluency and phonics and foundational literacy skills. But something that the English department noticed is that when we look at, and that is, doesn't mean that these are the only places where our students scored below the state average, but this particular this particular Excel tool that the state provides now is fantastic. So we input our data into a workbook that they give us so we can do this analysis. And we can sort by item type, by reporting category, by stand, uh, standard or by strand. 
So when the English department sorted by item type, what they noticed was that in the elementary grades, that when you look at the top three items, closed response would be like a short answer, ES would be an essay, selective response, SR is multiple choice. So when you look at those writing items, you see how much lower we're scoring than the state. And then if you move forward to grade seven, and again, grade, grade eight, did that cohort did not perform as well as we had hoped. Um, but if you look at grade seven, even looking at grade eight, the, where they scored, scored below the state was less than three or a negative seven points lower as opposed to 14 or 15 percentage points. So am I making sense when you look at the school state differences? Mm -hmm. When you look at the elementary, you can see some significant school state differences where our students are scoring far, far below or much lower than the state. And if you look at, then compare that to grade seven, even grade eight looks a little bit like grade four. So grade four uh, scored pretty much right at the state or look at grade 10. So that is an example of how we use these data to say, should we be looking at what kinds of tasks we're asking students to do? And um, the good news is, one of the 8,000 grants we got this year was a um, professional development in literacy instruction at the elementary grades. So that is something that a cohort of elementary teachers and, and Jen Dowd are participating in this year um, and looking at writing instruction and effective writing instruction. And those are our accountability data. Do you have any <coughs> questions about those, or comments about those gazillion slots? It's definitely helpful to see it like, um, broken down like this, you know, getting as granular as just the strands mm -hmm. of content. Um, you mentioned about the writing uh, piece. The figurative language is also Mm -hmm. kind of trend, is there any thought around what could be adapted for addressing, kind of getting, identifying uh, figurative language specifically? So, uh, at the elementary school, I, <laughs> I'm laughing because of a conversation that April and I had uh, prior to this meeting, as there been discussion, we were asking about this very same thing. So, at the elementary school, at the high school, departments, teachers, Everyone, these data, we have them in math, we have them in English, and I think every grade level team has looked at these data, Jen can speak to that, has have looked at these data and are, at, are, are then looking at their curriculum maps to say, okay, when and how do we teach this? Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a few questions you ask. One is, in our map, when and how are we teaching this? So sometimes in math, sometimes we're teaching something that if the MCAS happens in April, there's still May and June to teach. So sometimes it's a question of, is it something, uh, content that we're focusing on after the students are being assessed on it? Um, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, is the issue, students are certainly being asked to write at the elementary school, they're mm -hmm. writing a great deal, but then should we be looking at the kinds of tasks that they're, what kind of tasks are they being asked to do? Mm -hmm. So yes, at every grade level, then the grade level teams look at those maps and say, first, let's make sure we're teaching this content, yeah. let's point to where we're teaching it, and let's ask ourselves, what are we asking students to do to demonstrate mastery of the content, and, and is it a match for what they're then being asked to do in this county assessment? Any other questions? And the math department, the science teachers, they all looked at those, but I did not include all of those in the packet. That's really helpful to see it like that so you know where to focus in. Mm -hmm. I know it was helpful for, for my staff <coughs> to really look at the data and see where we need to drive our instruction and drive our, our curriculum maps so that we're addressing those deficits, those areas we weren't expecting to. Yeah. And we're having really nice um, conversations and dialogue around writing right now. Um, even though we're working mostly on the science and social studies curriculum, we've recognized now that you know writing is we ask students to write all the time, but um, how exactly and when exactly are we doing that to s facilitate um, a higher growth in those areas? So what I heard was that we would we were doubling down on P 
PD in writing, mm -hmm. and we were looking at the timing for these, for when we were producing stuff, and while the timing may not match now, we would be taking important things like uh, the figurative language pieces and thinking of what we weren't doing early enough right. in their in their progress so that they end up where they need to be by the time this testing happens. Exactly. And, and before we even received these results, um, Dr. McKenzie had written this early literacy grant, which was so important, and we were so excited to get it. So we have representatives um, from kindergarten first, second, and third, really looking at how we're approaching writing. Um, but then after we received the results, my the team of teachers that I work with are amazing, and they really recognize that the conversation has to be across the grade levels, kindergarten through six. So we're already having conversations at grade level meetings on how we're going to address it, um, and really, um, for me, allowing them time to look at the data and see where they can kind of embed those um, strategies, best teaching practices already in the curriculum that they have going. If it helps to think about a more specific example too, for seventh grade, we noticed that there was a couple that kept coming up for point of view. And so we looked back at the curriculum, it's taught in the first unit of the year. So then we looked at one that's closer to MCAS and where it might naturally make sense to just revisit that and go over that skill again. Mm -hmm. So that those are some of the types of conversations around that type of skill um, where you look at the curriculum and see when am I doing this mm -hmm. and how and where do we maybe just need to revisit that again because it's been a few months because with a lot of those skills you're not going to be working on them constantly like you don't do a point of view task with every single thing but you want to make sure that you have them often enough and spaced out and it may just be also in a social studies curriculum or how are we how are we doing that the really great news is um, I just feel so strongly that our communication between Hopkins and Hadley Elementary School has grown um, just in the year that I've been here so we're having these important discussions about how we're aligning things um, and the work that April is doing with the help of Dr. McKenzie. It's really, um, it's given us a new lens to look <coughs> at where we need to supplement the curriculum and how we're gonna best meet the students' needs. So I think the first one that they have in their packet is actually Hopkins Academy, but I know that Ms. Dawn usually elementary school. Yeah, I, I, she just told me. I, I saw that Hopkins was first in the packet, and then she said, I'm going first. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the old school kindergarten teacher in me. I will yeah. tell you what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Feel free. Um, no, but I, I do appreciate the opportunity to go first, and um, it's a nice segue to listening to the accountability of data and where we need to kind of drive things. I first want to um, thank the council for um, having me here tonight to present my strategic plan, um, and also I want to really thank my administrative team um, with the addition of April Camuso. Um, just for helping me get through the first year of being the principal at Hadley Elementary School, and I feel like we have a strong second year start here. Um, I also want to thank my incredible staff because they've really helped me along and succeed my first year. Um, so really my commitment um, is continued from last year. My overall goal is to make sure that Hadley Elementary School is a place where every child feels safe and feels welcomed and that their families feel the same way. So my strategic plan, um, while it talks a lot about um, data and accountability and, and the plans that were put in place, my overall goal is that feeling that you get when you walk through the doors at Hadley Elementary School and making sure that students feel safe there and that they are welcomed. So um, you do have my strategic plan in front of you um, in order to make sure that they feel um, supported in fostering an inclusive and diverse and positive learning environment. I'm going to highlight my initiatives. Um, the things that I'll continue to focus on this year include our continued commitment to analyzing and streamlining our curriculum maps that we were just speaking of, um, specifically for science and social studies, and to align our curriculum with grades K through 6. 
Uh, a lot of wonderful work has gone into, especially the social studies. We have a full day professional development day on Friday um, for families should know that there's no school on Friday. Uh, <laughs> gotten a lot of phone calls on that, which I think is brilliant. But just on a side note, to have a professional development day the day after Halloween. I don't know if you agree with that. I, I mean, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get a lot of argument from students that they appreciate having the day off after, after Halloween. Um, but really, we're going to be spending that time talking about the social studies curriculum and how we're going to streamline it um, kindergarten through grade six. As a school, we're also continuing with our data days. We finished our first one, and then we also had a progress monitoring meeting, which is extremely helpful to talk about the data, but then also take a break and let interventions happen, and they get together and see how it's going. It was almost like a problem-solving committee, um, and we did that in grade levels. And that's very helpful in looking at student-specific data, but also school-wide data. And we'll continue to do that. We have three data days throughout the school year with progress monitoring dates embedded um, throughout so we can problem solve as we're going through. And of course, we are looking at grade level um, MCAS data to work together. We're also looking at map testing in grades three through six. Uh, to ensure a safe and effective learning environment, Hadley Elementary School has also continued our commitment to the implementation of PBIS initiatives um, and the school-wide incentive program. I just completed my first round of pizza with the principal, <laughs> which was a lot of fun for students. And this month we have initiatives such as um, playing board games with staff, pumpkin crafts, and Valley Blue Sox prizes. Uh, staff is extremely thoughtful about things that interest them and how they can share that with students. And so that is, um, creates an excitement not only for the students, but for the teachers who are donating their time um, and sometimes their resources to get the kids excited about not only um, showing that they um, possess um, strategies to, to um, show kindness and school-wide, um, our school-wide Hawks behavior. The kids really, really um, love being able to get those wings and show that they are a part of the community and the staff's excited by it too. Um, in examining the data, we've also given additional multi-tiered systems of support or MTSS reading support, which is now extended into grade six this year. I think that's extremely helpful. We continue working on growing our Hadley Elementary School branding um, with the support of the PTO this year. We'll be working to include um, the Hadley Elementary School bumper stickers, long sleeve shirts, water bottles, shirts, and hoodies um, for our spirit wear orders, um, which are going to happen this November. Students have been encouraged to wear their spirit wear every Friday during the school year. And I know it's been fun for staff, too, to kind of dress down a little bit, but still show their school's pride. Um, and it's really nice to be in the community and see the kids wearing, wearing their shirts and, and being proud to be Hadley Elementary School students. Um, I also uh, continue to inform families of the Hadley Elementary School initiatives highlighted in my monthly family newsletter. I do it monthly. Um, my hat goes off to Dr. McKenzie who does it weekly. Um, that's a lot of work. Uh, but monthly it's really a nice opportunity to give parents yet another form of okay, this is what's happening in the school, these are the important dates, but also um, what, are our, what are our students doing? My hope is to, to grow that so that we can also do home links. So we're talking about the curriculum and we're talking about the curriculum updates so that families can have conversations about what their children are learning on a week-to-week -week basis. A lot of teachers already do that. They send home weekly newsletters. Um, but really I want to make sure that there's access for all students no matter who their teacher is, um, just making sure that every family feels like they have the knowledge of what their students are learning every day. I've also added a section this year in my monthly newsletter highlighting kindness. We call it HES Kind Kids. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to read that at all. It goes out monthly. Um, we had two students who went out of their way to really um, make a new student at Hadley Elementary School feel welcome. They wrote on their own, wrote um, this new student who was starting the next day a letter 
talking about all the great things that happened at Hadley Elementary School, how she might be nervous on her first day. And they posted it in her locker for when she first got there. So she started off her first day at Hadley Elementary School with a nice message. And so <coughs> I've asked teachers to nominate students so that I can highlight them in the newsletter. Um, and the response was <coughs> overwhelming. It really, it was fantastic. I wish I could share my email reel with everybody. I only picked one because I only have so much room. Um, but it was just a really nice moment for a building administrator to look back and see all the emails of the, of the nice things that are happening in our school with our students. Um, the last update that I'd also like to highlight that I'm sure Mr. Beck um, will speak to is that several Hadley Elementary School math teachers are collaborating in a joint PLC um, under the, the watch of April Camuso, which she'll also speak to with Had <coughs> Hopkins Middle School math teachers. Um, the PLC's goal is to increase student achievement and teacher collaboration through authentic data analysis of student and teacher work. Again, I think the collaboration um, aspect has really been strengthened um, just in the time that I've been here, and I'm excited to see the initiatives that we're building, um, not only through Hadley Elementary School, but carrying through to Hopkins Academy, and the conversations that we're having with each other has really been positive. Um, I'm really excited about the environmental piece. I have some students at the elementary level who are really excited um, and are gonna be doing a presentation school-wide, but also to the school council, uh, school committee rather, um, about what they would like to do, their straws, get rid of their plastic straws, you're starting small, but um, I'd like <coughs> to see how I could get Hopkins students to help them with that because they look up to you guys and I think that you'd really get a lot, of, a lot of students who are excited to work with you guys. So please consider us when you're making your plan. Um, and that's really all I have for for tonight. You have information in front of you. I'm open to questions. Anything that you want to ask me? I have a suggestion. Sure. Um, I know that um, last year's um, effort by Sir Simmons and others to host a, a time at have the elementary school where students could see Hopkins Academy in a positive light. Yes. That went over really well. Yes. Um, and I think that paired with other things like celebrating our seniors graduating at the elementary school, those kinds of things really helped create a, um, a positive image mm -hmm. on the part of students. I think, I wonder the extent to which that could start earlier in the year. I know, I think it was in the second half of the year that we had that last year. Right. And I think many parents' hopes on putting in for another school might start earlier. I wonder whether we should be looking at this the fall instead. It may or may not be too big for this fall. But um, another thing that came to mind was um, what opportunities might there be to infuse um, Hopkins Academy students, student action, um, interesting things like that into things that might already happen at the Hadley Elementary School. Um, if we can't do that this year, for instance, start earlier. I know the art, music, and um, special gym, PE um, community, those instructors are taking great initiative in holding that incredible event to the table. I think that's in the fall. Amped. Yeah. Amped. Mm -hmm. And I think it leads up to the winter concert, not the spring concert. Amped is usually, Amped night is usually after the, the winter concert. Okay. Um, yeah. After the winter concert, mm -hmm. but before the end of the year. Yes, correct. I'm not sure about that. I, I feel mm -hmm. like I feel like for last year, my student was preparing for the concert, and that was his first time up on stage, practicing. I'll have to look back at that. <coughs> yeah. Nevertheless, maybe that's it. Right. Because we're taking over the gym. We already have janitorial mm -hmm. services. We already have parents there. We already have we have parents there. Yes. With their kids, maybe that's an opportunity to showcase a bit of Hopkins Academy magic, like what's mm -hmm. going on here and other such things. Maybe there's a way to um, to bring more of that into the fall. I, I couldn't agree more. I do think that there's great opportunity to link the two schools together. Um, I think we're doing a nice job of having staff communicate with each other, but how does that look overall for the district? 
Um, Eric Sudnick, who did reach out to me uh, last week, asked if he could have some of the um, uh, kiddos who are in his sports groups come and do some readings with the elementary level. And so they we're going to be doing that for early December. So that will be in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. So Hopkins players will come and read to the elementary school students. So we're already thinking about how we're going to um, create those times. Um, and it is hard to kind of carve out a time to make sure that we're doing that, but it is important work. So I was excited about um, Mr. Sudnick reaching out to us and wanting to do that with his players. And so um, any suggestions like that, how we can get more parents to be involved and see the wonderful things that are happening at Hopkins at a much earlier time than just waiting till the end of the school year. I'm open for, for all and any suggestions. Um, and I can really work with Mr. Beck about looking at what kind of opportunities we can facilitate um, and getting maybe a master calendar. And, and then we can invite the stakeholders in that might want to participate. So, yeah. I was thinking about in, I think it's in February, we're hosting here again another robotics mm -hmm. um, qualifier match, which there's a handful of Hopkins kids that are helping to lead that team, the, the yeah. elementary kids might find that. I know it's on the weekend, but yeah. they might find that really interesting to see that there's so many different schools and yeah. families that come to that to see the different designs that go into developing these, these um, robots to meet a particular challenge. And we did have a group of students come and present that at yeah. Hadley Elementary School yeah. during, during the cafeteria times, which I have to tell you, is, for me, it's just a home run because there is nothing quicker and easier to get a cafeteria room full of children quiet than bring in the Hopkins students. <laughs> so they are the best lunch duty kiddos I've ever seen. So they and just they sit there and want to watch. Hopkins Academy next year. It's pretty good. Sign up to do lunch duty. That's it. And I, will, I will happily take any Hopkins students to help me out in that venture. Um, but yeah, and just um, the students coming over to show the instruments. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. that was that was such a great experience to watch the kids watch the students and and get excited about what instruments they'd like to play. Yeah. So really making sure that we provide more opportunities where our kids can work together and it's it's nice to see them waving to each other and you know they've been together some of them and this was the first time that the students were coming back and so it's really nice to see. That um, competition is such a. Um, a, uh, an exciting event. There's mm -hmm. so much energy in the auditorium. Mm -hmm. um, there's, and you know, it's uh, it's great to hear about the presentation afterwards. But it's also it would be an incredible opportunity to have the space to bring the students in, even though it is a weekend. I wonder what incentives could be offered. For instance, imagine if there were free pizza for every Hopkins student that mm -hmm. came and, and watched that. Yeah. Of course, we don't have a budget for that today, but imagine that we found a sponsor and right. that um, was enough of a draw yeah. for students yeah. to want to come out and bring their, obviously their parents would drive them. But, um, no, I agree. I think there's things that could be done to help bring in more uh, local uh, students for that. that Definitely. Yeah, it is an exciting environment. Either way, those, those, those meets are open to all, so the elementary yeah. students could go. So mm -hmm. maybe a reminder before the event to students mm -hmm. and then send home to the parents. And especially, the, sorry. No, especially because I know that there's a lot of kids that have an interest in that type. They do the STEAM lab over there and whatnot. Yes. Right. And it's Absolutely. become a really big thing to do coding. Like over the summer, they did the Lego coding. A lot of kids are into that. Yeah. So if there's a little reminder sent home to parents right before it to kind of remind them that it's coming. I was going to say that it, it's one of those things that's also really important for the parent community to, to understand that we may have only one year left of um, after this year of um, really the parent support for the uh, Evolution Robotics team really yeah. centered around the efforts of Bob and Christine Cullen and, and the parents of the students who have served on that team and of course Kieran will graduate next year. And so, you know, that parent support in the community would be really important for somebody to sort of pick up that mantle and keep it going. At the same time, um, last year's valedictorian, Aiden Cullen, um, had uh, also done a significant amount of volunteer work down at the library and at the elementary school to teach kids robotics. And so, 
hoping to create a, um, within the students a, a, an elevated level of interest and initiative that hopefully a parent will jump in and say, hey, we can do this. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe that there'll be a, a pretty substantial group of students at the elementary school who would be interested in climbing on and then you know, we're able to refeed a structure that was started by parents and really, you know, needs to continue with parents. We do have a robotics club here, but it competes somewhat differently. Um, and the Evolution Robotics program that was established has been um, just an incredible experience for the kids who have been involved and actually really neat for other kids to see as, as fans. So. school strategy and the, the highlights you went over, it's, it's exciting to think about it and um, great to see some of the things that we've, we've thought through over time come to fruition in this plan, so thank you. Great. All right. Brian, I suppose you're up next, right? <laughs> now, we'll go back and You well, can go now. It would only be <laughs> I noticed Pam and April didn't step in front of me. Um, I could. So, <laughs> Of the, the ten, uh, 10 items that are identified in the plan across the four standards, many of them are first year uh, parts of multi-year initiatives. And uh, as uh, Dr. McKenzie had indicated, um, there has been a significant amount of grant writing to the extent that it was uncomfortable at times to walk into her office, not because she would do anything other than when I'd poke my head in, we, there was something that we would call grant face. And we would say, how's, how's, how's Annie doing? So well, she's got grant face, so you don't necessarily want to go and bother her. But, um, no, I have an assistant grant writer. Though. Yes, so right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what her face looks like after a couple of days. Assistant grant face. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> It's a good Halloween costume. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go through almost in order, but I will end with the career day because of all of the things. One, uh, um, it is an extension from last year, but it's not something that we're looking at uh, as a product, this event being a single product from last year's strategy plan. Part of this year's uh, strategy plan is to improve those, um, those offerings. And, and so I'll come back to that at the end and just give you a menu of the presenters that kids will be choosing from. Um, the first thing is uh, identifying aspects of the School Redesign Institute um, from the learning excursions trip. I'm, I'm really pleased and very appreciative of the number of members of the Hopkins Academy faculty who, you know, when things get sort of imposed from the outside, it can be very difficult for people to want to take things on. And we had a really significant number of people who jumped in at the invitation to uh, volunteer their time, put effort into the number of initiatives that came from Annie's grant writing efforts. And um, that's really important because it helps us uh, really on the ground level um, to continue to cultivate teacher support, and student support, parent support from the inside as opposed to having something that's imposed on us by the state um, or an outside organization or even the school administration for that matter. So I'm really appreciative of those who have volunteered their time. Um, Three of those people, well, yeah, two of those people at the high school level are Ms. Camuso and Ruth Ann Fitzgibbons, who will join Dr. McKenzie and I on the learning excur excursions trip. And the biggest thing for us and to be know. able to, yeah, I'm sorry, and and humor, and um, that um, the biggest thing I think for me in terms of getting something out of that is making sure that. Um, Often when you go to, to things like this, which I've heard from folks at NEASC when I made the phone call to um, delay submission of our two-year progress report, they were very excited that we had the opportunity to do this because many of them had been on the same excursion in San Diego and they were able to talk to, to us about um, that opportunity. And one of the, one of the I guess, admonitions that uh, Director Edwards gave was, Make sure that your team understands that you're going to come back really inspired and you need to pull it together one step at a time because there are so many things that will leave, leave us wanting to do things and looking for resources. So really, this school improvement initiative is to generate a report, a, a summary of our findings and being able to identify next steps um, to feed what would come out of the learning excursions um, grant efforts and the opportunity for all, for all of us to go and see something that's very different from what we do and very innovative and how can we put that into action in subsequent school years. Um, the next item is the, the development of the early college, high school and innovation pathways at Hopkins Academy. 
this will be a little bit more than a summary in that I would anticipate that we'll be putting together an action plan that will have some requirements put in place for us as, you know, as early as the end of this year or even into next year. And so these grants um, that Dr. McKenzie has written, she's kept us well informed about timelines and deadlines for next stages uh, in through the course of this year to be able to meet those deadlines to be eligible for the opportunities that will come up uh, either for trainings or for potential financing that might come our way through any, any of the grants that are, are available in early college, high school, and in innovation pathways. The next category is um, the MICAP, like Massachusetts College and Career Advising Program. Uh, myself, Jason Burns, and uh, guidance counselor Anna Campetti went to the first of three sessions that we have to go through that are offered by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, it was very, uh, it was a very good uh, conference. Their materials, the research is very good, and some of the information will actually uh, include in the student packets that they'll receive for the um, career day because we got a lot of connections to uh, websites that will enable students to begin researching labor markets, and many of those websites update their research over time so that they can keep those links with them, and those folders will follow them for seventh grader through all six years of high school, and they can use that as sort of a centerpiece from year to year seeing different careers and working those into their plans. Today we also had um, a conference call with Naviance, which is our, our post-secondary planning system, and that really is a centerpiece. One of those systems is, is really a centerpiece to uh, what every school needs to do to bring this across to their students. It has uh, components that we haven't explored yet, and so Ms. Campetti and Mr. Burns um, did a conference call today to find out you know, what features we have in Naviance, what we would like to be able to do now that we went to the first offering for MyCap, and, you know, what those, what those costs will be for next step. And it's perfect timing because we're in the process of budget planning, um, and also have the opportunity to conceivably make some requests of perhaps the Board of Trustees or um, Helping Hearts for Hadley Schools or the Edward Hopkins Foundation, because some of those modules are relatively inexpensive to add on. Um, but adding them all together will add up over time. So if we can go at it piecemeal, uh, add some of those things and become facile with them now, uh, we'll be better off with our students and getting information out to parents with our Navion system. Um, in management and operations, uh, this year we're gathering data. Um, we as an administrative team um, went to the Massachusetts Tiered Systems of Support Leadership Institute. And so really the first stage was to pull your leaders in and tell them how challenging this can be uh, and how exciting this can be. I felt like it was a, it was a very good offering. Uh, I, I learned a lot about the things that um, schools face in terms of integrating tiered systems of support um, and what schools need to do uh, in terms of being able to identify structures that allow them to not only be able to gather the data, um, but to then be able to respond to it with either whole class instructional adjustments or individualized plans for students who are identified as not meeting those learning targets that we've established as thresholds for learning. In particular, um, for us, that, that, that focus still remains on middle school mathematics and a big part of this for me is gonna be supporting uh, the math PLC that's being run, uh, overseen by Ms. Camuso, and they have their next meeting on November 1st. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things that we wanted to be able to do as a leadership team, and this also includes students, is to create and implement protocols to allow the high school leadership team to assess the value of events and or programs that compete with instructional time. For example, the career day. Um, that's taking, it on, it's taking a half day, but that's instructional time. Uh, I'm very pleased that every member of our faculty value and is protective of their instructional time. At the same time, there are initiatives that come up from time to time, either from initiative of the faculty and very often by initiative from student groups. And to give you an example of um, something that worked really well because I believe that students feel comfortable speaking with me and other, uh, other members of the staff in, in positions of authority, that um, there was a Saturday uh, powder puff football game that was planned and the request came in to approve it with very little time up until that meeting and the student council and diversity club also had a number of things 
underway at the time. And so my initial response to a student leader very informally was it was, dis it was discouraging it because I felt like they were spreading themselves too thin and they were going to leave themselves in a, uh, in a very difficult circumstance, maybe not getting the level of participation that they wanted because there was a lot going on. That student leader met with their groups um, the following day and then came back to me with an advisor and said, listen, we actually have a lot of this stuff done. We've already identified a number of participants. And so I was very glad that they took the discouragement back, identified that they're in better shape, and then said, no, we're in, we're in good shape. And I immediately approved it. Um, so that, as an example, isn't a great example because it didn't compete with instructional time. But being able to take um, items like that and be able to identify the value of it, in particular when it <clears throat> is going to impact instructional time is really important to all of the teachers in our building and, and the time that we have in terms of coverage and uncoverage within our curriculum. There are times of the year, for example, like we can't do anything in May. There's advanced placement testing, MCAS testing, so on and so forth. So while we have some rules of thumb that are sort of universal, um, these things come up all the time and uh, almost all of them are very worthwhile. What we want to be able to do is have a structure that allows us to be able to make decisions based on data that says we need this. Um, or on something that we believe is going to be valuable to the, to the culture and the climate of the school. Um, school council, going on to um, family and community engagement. The school council, it's been a little while since as a school, it's probably been two and a half years since we've actually conducted a survey of parents. The school council would like to gather some information. We're going to look at the results of the most recent Spiffy survey. Um, we're going to take a look at the um, responses from, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the recommendations from the decennial report that we have to submit for the two-year progress report and see if there's information that we could gather in there to get some of those um, some of those recommendations characterized as completed by the time we submit the report and see what the council wants to survey parents about. And then we would bring those, the results of those surveys back to the faculty and back to school committee to share along with any potential recommendations that might come with school council. So that seems to be open-ended, but we're actually looking at some foundation information to establish uh, what we want to look at in surveying parents in the community. It might be good to tie that in with the um, school start time initiative, if that's possible. You know, in terms of if you're going to leverage that, the outreach um, that you've got that other Yep, well, and we could do it in the same, there, yep, feedback. absolutely. I'm going to skip over the career day thing to finish with that. Um, the school council also has an obligation um, as part of their charge under uh, the IT Reform Act to evaluate the student code of conduct. In, in our case, we want to evaluate the student code of conduct by looking at um, not only our data in the Spiffy survey and vocal survey, say, survey data that comes from the Department of Education, um, but with an eye toward equity and the effectiveness of any of the um, sanctions that might exist for particular penalties in the student code of conduct. Uh, and their effectiveness in cultivating positive student behaviors. We feel like this is particularly important given, given the fact that we're looking at a, a baseline year um, moving on to professional culture, working with Sarah Wickham to gather data to establish a baseline uh, for the future implement, implementation of PBIS structures um, at Hopkins Academy in beginning of the seventh grade. So um, we feel like it's a good time for us to look at the student code of conduct uh, as, an, as a school community as a representative um, with that group being highly representative of stakeholders in the school community. It's parents, there's students such as Jack. Um, we have a great group of students uh, who have joined this year as well. So just we have five students, one senior, three juniors, and a sophomore, um, all of whom will give us insight and, and help us with each of those projects. And then as part of professional culture, this is another um, grant resulted uh, opportunity for us, and this really involves the entire administrative team, all four of us, uh, along with Dr. McKenzie. We're, we've been accepted as part of the Massachusetts Cohort uh, Leadership Program Evaluation, where we're going to go through. We, we've selected uh, professional learning communities to, um, actually, I think you guys, did you guys select that on Wednesday? Yeah. The previous one, when, when we were at the training. So they selected professional learning communities, and I think that that makes sense because that's what each and every member of our faculty and staff in the district is expected to be able, is expected to put together from year to year um, 
their, in their own professional development plan. So if we're going to take a look at something in terms of the way that they spend their time, I think it, um, what will come out of that will be a, a new process at all of the school or district-wide process for um, improving and expanding our professional learning communities. And then tomorrow, our students will register. Today, I sent out the descriptions um, for the career day, which will take place on Halloween. And <coughs> very appreciative of the fact that we have uh, more than 20 presenters who will put together 16 offerings. Um, later in the year, uh, Sir Simmons is going to take his second shot at the uh, financial literacy fair. Um, and so both of those offerings will be evaluated this year and recommendations will come back to the school council uh, as well as school committee on how we can make improvements uh, to these for next year. So um, the offerings are uh, property management and restaurant ownership as entrepreneurship. Uh, that's going to be Jen Jennifer Mendelson and Bruce Cicci from Arizona Pizza. <coughs> uh, E-commerce e project management and computer program. Jeremy Daly, who's the keynote speaker, uh, is providing an offering that involves um, writing code and leading technologically, uh, technological teams. Um, and he's a, uh, an expert in emerging serverless technology, and we'll speak to that a little bit as well. Performing arts and entertainment, Michael Klesch and, and my daughter Maeve um, are putting, have put together an offering in performing arts and entertainment. Um, environmental engineering, we're fortunate to have Amelia Rotaru and Erica Burns, who are environmental engineers from the University of Massachusetts. Electrical and computer engineering, in particular as it applies to pharmaceuticals, and I'm not sure if this is a relative. Jonah? My husband. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Doesn't yes. get much more of a relative. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we're very excited. Uh, there are a number of kids that are very interested in that for uh, reasons related to both engineering and learning something about the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, biological Sciences, Land and Natural Resource Management and Education, Jennifer Lapis and David Sagan from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Business Management, Rachel Snyder, who's the Assistant Director for Career Development at the Eisenberg School of Management at the University of Massachusetts. We have Mim Zayas, who's the Vice President of Operations at United Personnel, a staffing agency who can speak to multiple areas as well as employment skills. Um, Allison Ouellette who is an RN and also Paul's wife, and my wife, Rebecca, who will do natural health care and medicine and childbirth services. Uh, innovation management, organizational behavior, industry, and education. Um, Humera will also provide an offering. Dairy production and animal husbandry. We're very lucky. I'm hoping Jen Zena will bring in some chocolate milk for us from Maple mm -hmm. Line Farm as well. We have a medical laboratory technician, Bridget Osborne, who works at uh, Bay State Franklin Medical Center in, in the lab up there and has extensive knowledge of the other kinds of laboratory operations that happen in the medical field. Uh, representatives from public safety, emergency management, and law enforcement will also provide an offering about the variety of careers for first responders. Drew Hutchinson and Tim Sweeney are putting together an offering for film and television production. You guys know Drew from here in Hadley. And Tim Sweeney is a friend of mine who works for the Hollywood Filmmaker <coughs> as a camera assistant and most recently finished shooting the second season of Castle Rock with J.J. Abrams in uh, Orange. Strategic Initiatives Admi and Administration and Investment Management. We're being joined by Michelle Equale from uh, Mass Mutual's Investment Management Division and a marketing research scientist, Emily Pfeffer, who has just sw switched over to her dream job at Forrester Research. So those are the 16 offerings, and we're very excited also that uh, the Board of Trustees has sponsored this, and that the Sugar Shack is going to be providing all of the presenters and the faculty with a lunch immediately following dismissal of students. So that's what's going on this week. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Any questions?
So I just um, want to thank you guys for having us here tonight um, and just wanted to touch on a few different areas that I'll be focusing on this year and some of it is continued work from last year. Um, so like Brian mentioned, um, in September we had um, Annie, Jen, Brian and I had attended a NTSS um, leadership um, training. It was a two-day training that the state had offered and so just wanting to continue when we're working on our MTSS initiatives in the district, just that was a great training. Um, and one of my big takeaways from that training was really about universal learning and just how we can meet the needs of all learners, whether they're um, in special education or not. So it was, uh, there was one speaker who was um, just pretty captivating for me and just the way she talked about how just different things that teachers can do in their classrooms to that you know, it doesn't have to be you have an IEP or you have a 504 or an accommodation plan, that we can just do this because it's the right thing to do for kids. So I uh, want to continue supporting um, the district with that. Um, the other thing is just um, the work that we're doing at HESS with our um, data team meetings and the progress monitoring um, meetings that we're having. And so continuing to have the special education staff participate in those. And this year, um, for a part of one of the data team meetings that I was in, it was great to see, you know, there was general ed teachers, our Title I teacher, um, the special education teacher, and myself all having some good conversation about how we can make sure we're providing interventions for kids, adjusting schedules so that we're really <coughs> getting the most bang for our buck. So definitely felt good about um, kind of that exciting work that we were doing to meet um, student needs. Um, the other thing I want to kind of start working on this year is um, developing and enhancing some of our um, opportunities for students ages 14 to 22. Um, it's from being here now for a couple years we're, we're a small district so we don't have lots of different options um, for students on, in special education for their some of their transition planning and different programs that we can have them participate in. So I recently went to a transition resource fair and it was great to make some new connections, get some information about just the different opportunities that are out there for students and how, so my one of my goals this year is really to work on just having more options for kids and getting that information out when we're at some meetings and we're talking about what kids want to do um, when they're, as they're thinking about their adulthood. Um, so. And that would be partnering with Mass Rehab and uh, Department of Developmental Disabilities and then different area agencies in our community. Um, the other thing I'm excited about this year, um, Annie and I worked um, <coughs> hard to set up some clinical supervision this year for our um, counseling staff, both at Hopkins and at HES. So that includes our school psychologist, the adjustment counselor, um, myself, and our BCBA. And so we have a consultant from UMass, um, Sarah Pfeffer, and so she's coming in. We're meeting once a month, and so we're um, so we're really following. We've the, our first meeting, we created this whole framework through the problem-solving method, and so part of what we're going to be doing is part of the time will be spent on working on specific case consultations, where we really want to come together as a group to talk about a specific case and. Um, how we can identify what the concerns are and how we want to address it. And then the second part of our time is to work on some content specific learning that we might want. If there's a topic that we're interested, like last month we, um, we wanted to kind of share all the resources we all have around data collection and how we collect data for different um, types of social, emotional, or behavioral um, things that are going on for students. So um, just kind of using the expertise of our group, but also our consultant um, to make progress in our own professional development. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to touch on, um, we've talked about this before, about our CPAC, our parent Special Education Parent Advisory Group, and just ways to kind of gear up additional attendance in some of those meetings. So this summer, I was speaking with um, the Special Education Director in Granby, and so we ended up um, <coughs> creating a little group with Granby, Belchertown, South Hadley, um, and Hadley for the four CPACs we met this summer and through the Federation of Children with Special Needs 
like we all have memberships there, so we were able to each get a free training. So we we're able to kind of pool that together. We came out with a schedule. Um, so each district is hosting a training, and then we have other meetings where we're getting together with um, either by ourselves in our district or as a group to um, just kind of work together and be collaborative. And the federation is um, super excited about us kind of working together. So in February, Hadley, will, the one that I signed up for us to do is working on transition planning. So we'll host that actually here at Hopkins. Um, so we'll hopefully get some good attendance there this year. So um, yeah, so those are some of just to highlight on a few things that I'm focusing on and looking forward to working with all of these guys and Dr. McKenzie this year. <laughs> I especially like how you're collaborating with the three other districts. That's a great way to leverage all, all our resources, especially for smaller districts, right. unable to do the kind of thing that that you want to do, like this one specific area that's really inspired right. you. You can really maximize. Right. Right, and it allowed us to, you know, yeah, every district has to do a basic rights training. So, but we we've had that training many times. So it's exciting to um, be able to just hear some of the other trainings that are offered through the federation. So, and it was great too. The parents were able, like when we met over the summer, we invited um, you know parents to it. So it was good even just for the parents from the different communities to be able to just meet each other and make those connections. A bigger too. network. Right. Yeah. Exactly. With different viewpoints in different districts ways of addressing right. things. Absolutely. Things in context. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And next is the curriculum plan. <laughs> um, so thank you for having me here. Thank you for this. I'm really excited about my new role, which is a part-time role as Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. And through this role, this year, I'm hoping to support the district in its efforts to develop a collaborative, reflective, and inclusive environment. So to do this, I have three primary goals, which have a couple of subparts, but essentially it's three larger things that I'm working on. So the first one has to do with curriculum itself and trying to do what seems like a not very exciting task, but important task of acquiring and organizing all of the curriculum in the district so that we as teachers and students, but then also outside of the school, parents and the community have access to it and can find it easily and reference it and understand it. Um, so that's sort of an ongoing process, and related to that, I'm also working on developing a more formal curriculum review process so that we have something that says, you know, in this year we're looking at the curriculum for all of social studies, and in this year we're looking at science, as well as the tools that we will use to then evaluate that curriculum and the committee that we will have to take a look at that curriculum. So I'm working on putting all of those things together as one of my first goals. Um, in addition to that, <coughs> working in a few different areas related to the grants. So you heard about a whole bunch of grants tonight. I don't necessarily have a very specific role for all of the grants, except to offer support where support is needed for those. And so that can look like different things, um, whether it's research or working on scheduling and putting people together or brainstorming or actually writing a grant, depending on what it is. That's what I do, so today I spent some time with Jason Burns talking about the Early College High School grant and thinking about uh, the Hopkins schedule in relation to that grant. So I fill in wherever I'm asked to fill in within any of those things. And then third, the part that is most interesting to me is working with teachers, and so I'm doing that in a couple of different ways. Um, one of the things that I'm doing there is the math PLC, which you guys heard a lot about. And so that professional learning community is meant to help both teacher improvement and student achievement. Um, but it's also meant to teach the teachers about teaming and collaboration, and then to serve as a model to continue that work in other places as well. Teachers working together and collaborating together end up, um, in my opinion, and according to a lot of the research, more successful because of um, social capital rather than just human capital. So this idea that they will learn more from one another and those resources that they share rather than what they just know by themselves in isolation. So that's really sort of the theory behind working together in that way. And so my role is to design those meetings and then to facilitate them. And over the course of the year, 
uh, the goal would be for me to sort of pull myself out from facilitating, have some of the other teachers facilitate those meetings themselves so they can get that practice in. And then during those times, I would observe them and use a rubric to give them feedback about their teaming and their collaboration so that we can look at different areas around decision making and evaluation and action taking and things of that nature. And so that's a big part of what I'm doing there. I'm also helping uh, by serving on the district team around PBIS. So I'm, I don't know everything that we're doing, so we just started that one. <laughs> but I'm on that, so I will help out there as directed. Uh, and then last, I am working with teachers in general. So I've offered myself in terms of coaching services for teachers who might want me to work with them in their classroom, um, whether it's around instructional strategies or classroom management, whatever their problem with practice may be. I've asked for them to invite me into their rooms, and then I'll give them some feedback or help them with some lesson designs or assessment design. And so I have a few teachers that I've done that with or am in the process right now, and then a couple more that have reached out to me about setting that up as well. Um, and then related to that too, although I'm not sure it's in my document, I don't know that it matters, is I'm also working with the administrative team on their joint leadership observations. And so with that, that's been working with them to calibrate their feedback as a leadership team, and then that way they can um, give some helpful feedback to the teacher. So they would go into a room and just watch one teacher, but all is a scary group together. You know, they wouldn't be scary, <laughs> but they go in together. Um, so I'm, I'm working on facilitating that with them as well. And that's pretty much it for this year. know of specific students that um, that we had this resignation and then fortunately um, Jack Corrigan who was a former school um, psychologist um, Annie and I reached out to him so he graciously um, is um, coming to Hopkins um, to help support us during this interim period of time so between Mr. Horrigan uh, Laura Rice the school psychologist at um, Hopkins and then um, between the two of them, actually. <laughs> Thinking there's a third, but that's the person we have to hire. Uh, so between Jack and Laura, and then actually the school guidance counselor, Anna Campetti, we're able to, um, I'm able to have um, staffing at the building for at least part of each day, which was what my goal was. So Laura Rice is um, full days at Hopkins on Tuesdays and Fridays, um, but I've asked her to, um, and Jack will be able to be there for right now on Mondays and Thursdays for a half day, So, and I've asked Laura to just spend her morning at Hopkins on Wednesdays so that she, you know, they can kind of take the pulse of the building if anything's coming up um, and be able to um, then kind of, we can triage from there as we need to. Um, and then send out obviously that communication plan to staff so they know kind of what the process is um, during this period of time where we're getting in applications, which we've gotten a number. So um, Annie and I are reviewing those and Laura Rice and I will do a first round of interviews and then Annie and I will Thank you. 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 Thank
Yes, so annually I share this with you, uh, the district professional development plan, and try to align those activities to the goals of the district. I've already mentioned several things that are in there, the literacy work that the elementary school is doing. You've heard reference to the tiered systems of support, leadership uh, training that we went to, a number of other uh, positive behavioral interventions and supports, the PLC or professional learning community work. So several things that you heard referenced in the plans that you just heard are included in the district professional development plan, something we have to do annually, we submit to the state annually, and I then share it with you. Any questions on the plan? All right. Mm -hmm. Job description for after school program leader. So the Hadley Kids, the never ending story. Just a quick update on Hadley Kids. Things are going extremely well. We have <coughs> right now, in September, we had 64 students registered in October. I think that just dropped by one to 63 students. That's not families, those are individual students. Um, so things are going well. We've also surveyed families about their interest in the before school program. We had 26 students uh, interested, so some families had two students, some would have one in the before school program, and an additional 12 uh, pre-K students, families who are interested in aftercare. So we've had, um, we have even more uh, interest in before and aftercare. You have previously approved a position for a program director under those qualifications. It said a minimum of a bachelor's degree. I've talked with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Right now, the director of Park and Rec has been acting as the program director. And we've talked, and it is just, it's, it's just not tenable for her to continue to do both her duties for Park and Rec and to continue doing that and being on site every day. Um, we posted in anticipation that the school committee might approve this internally. We have had uh, interest internally. We have some very um, high functioning and committed and talented adults who are working in that program who really stepped up when uh, Jenny was on her honeymoon, on vacation. They're interested. They don't have uh, necessarily that educational qualification. I contacted the department and they said given my uh, proximity and frequency with which I'm on site over there, that my license is more than sufficient, um, but you would just change what you call the person who's on site for all three hours and the primary person responsible. So what you have in front of you is um, that program leader is by design, so it's, it's uh, leader and the educational um, Skills and experience have changed so that uh, a bachelor's degree in um, early education and care is not a requirement. And if the school committee approves this, then what would happen is that would allow the director of Park and Rec, Jenny, to go back to providing some administrative support seven and a half hours a week, which is what Park and Rec had kind of hoped for initially. Um, we would hire an uh, interested and qualified person from our existing staff to do this work of on-site being the primary leader position on-site every day, Monday through Friday. Um, and um, yeah, and rather than having Park and Rec do that 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. May I make a motion? Of course. A motion to approve the removal of the um, educational license as a requirement for this position. So if, are you comfortable approving the job description as yes. presented here? Um, I would like to actually sure. make one suggestion. Of course. Yeah. <clears throat> um, looking at the education skills and experience, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if there's some form of additional training that this person could attend that would be like a, some form of like de-escalation training or um, so something that would get sure. into like the, into more of that social emotional aspect of it um, to try to help the children, help children of all needs in these programs. Yes. So I can add, de-escalation is something that's required of all of our staff. So every Hadley uh, kids employee, even our student employees, have to go through all of our online trainings that the adults have to do. But I can also add de-escalation and well, social and emotional skills. And I know there's, like, there's different forms yep. of de-escalation training yep. where there's like the longer workshops yep. and then just the online yep. thing. Of course. So it would be like the, yep. hopefully the longer workshop. Yep. Absolutely. So is there a motion to approve then the um, program leader job description as amended? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
Great, thank you. Great. Good to meet you. Thanks. Um, establishment of after school program revolving fund. You have an opinion from Attorney Dupre, mm -hmm. and so we don't need actually town meeting to do this. You all can establish the revolving fund, which is fantastic. So uh, once you do that, and Hadley Kids has finished with their dissolution, they can then just offer you the gift. And you can vote to accept the gift that would be separate, but first you have to have the account to put it in. So the vote that's on the upcoming warrant is to the town to accept gift. the gift. Got it. And then the gift could come okay. to us. Um, Got it. Yeah. Okay. So we motion to establish the um, after school program revolving account. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Ethics disclosures for field trips. You'll also. see more of these. So right. you may have seen the story in the paper about that teacher in South Hadley uh, who, um, of course, I don't know all the details, but the paper is public, and I'm just going to assume I always feel badly for people that I'm, I'm going to assume thought that they were doing everything right because they're publicizing what they're doing and they're working with a national organization. But as it turns out in Massachusetts, those ethics rules that we take a test on and we sign for every two years are extremely strict and so because organizations like EF well because teachers get the equivalent because often because they're chaperones and the chaperones part of the trip is paid for if they're not paying that's worth more than fifty dollars um, so that constitutes if it's not disclosed that constitutes a violation of the ethics law the teacher <coughs> was personally fined seven thousand uh, dollars as a result of that from and she was a chaperone on the EF trips so I sent the article to all of our staff. I asked the attorney to do a legal opinion, which also went to all the staff. And as you can see, so we already signed for the upcoming excursion one of these disclosures. So it's actually a second disclosure that at least the staff will do. I'm not sure I'll have to check if you have to do it also, Humara. And then you'll see copies of those in your school committee packet. So just know that's why you're getting those. And school committee members, if you ever accept anything that is of value, even if it's in kind, but it's worth more than, if it's worth $51, um, certainly you can always contact Fred, you can contact me, and I can send you, and you can just call the Ethics Commission. It's quite simple to do. Uh, we have a, a parent at the elementary school who's a wonderful parent that is able, through a foundation, to provide training for our staff most of whom are special educators to work with a particular disability, students with a particular disability, that training is valued at uh, $250. That has to be disclosed. Failure to disclose it is a violation of the ethics law. Um, so you'll see, you'll see those disclosures in school committee packets. That's why. And of course, if you all ever have a question about the value of any in-kind contribution that you receive in your role as an elected official, contact Fred or call me. That was a hefty fine. So as it relates to that December workshop, Andy, that we're all mm -hmm. going on, the stipend for that, that covers my <coughs> expense, mm -hmm. um, the airfare, hotel, meals, car, mm -hmm. et cetera, that will be something that you will be able to disclose on all of our behalf? Yes, yeah, so you already have something. I'm going to have Fred review it. But a copy of those disclosures will be in the school committee packet in November. I don't believe there's any vote required, but we're required. And then we're also required to file them with the town clerk. So I take them from here and I have to send them over to the town side. And the November meeting will be in time enough yes. for our December yeah. Yeah. Um, workshop. Yeah. So okay. we'll see a lot more of those. Fun code 191, shared services. Hatfield would like to take the lead on this. I just printed for you the overview from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the uh, grant announcement. Uh, the Hatfield school district and the school committee is interested in evaluating the possibility of sharing services in food service so they run into the same problems that we do they have although it's not common for us to vote as a school committee before applying for a grant the Hatfield school committee asked that they have a vote on record that you all are interested or willing to do this joint grant they will take a lead on writing it they would just like to Explore. So the purpose of the grant would be to explore shared services in food service in particular. Are there ways that we can increase efficiency, um, improve our bottom lines, which look similar in both districts? Do we know, do they use any kind of 
PO, POS like um, school bus that. system like we do? I don't know if they okay. use a POS system. I know they don't outsource it at all. It's all in house, but I don't know if they have a point of sale. I'd like to make a request. Yes. That uh, that we not uh, explore efficiency um, or productivity at the expense of quality. Mm -hmm. Uh, as I hear, I hear about food quality yeah. often, as I'm sure many of, of, of the parents do. Um, so we should either maintain, ideally not maintain, but rather enhance quality. And maybe our combined um, leverage as two small districts potentially becoming um, one combined larger purchasing power mm -hmm. could enable us to actually um, get better at doing food service and maybe even as a result bring in greater income to both districts to support the activities because students want to eat food. Mm -hmm. Piggybacking on that a little bit, um, we heard earlier the um, the reports um, from students where there is the, the, the um, desire for the more environmentally sustainable um, activities and when I heard the four um, categories, my first thought actually went to food service, because mm -hmm. um, you're talking about increasing trucking um, to get more stuff from different companies and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, so I would, I would just like to keep that in mind yep. as well. That's good. To build on that even further, <laughs> um, our big, um, the, the big 350 person event that I hold each year, last year went um, zero uh, carbon footprint by having entirely compostable um, Mm -hmm. uh, supplies, um, as well as um, uh, a, a program that um, separated food so that the food was food waste was going into compost and mm -hmm. back to the back to the soil. So, anyways, all of those things are opportunities for us to be economical and also environmentally friendly. I suggest we do that at the same time. Perfect. I will give them all that feedback if it is the will of the committee for them to pursue the grant. Yes. Do we need to vote on that? Yeah, they'd yeah. like to vote. Okay. Yeah. Motion to approve a, um, exploration of a joint grant between Hadley, Hadfield and Hadley, led by Hadfield. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, um, do we need to go back to the GSA at all? No, the students have something, and I'll invite them again, but the okay. students are looking to change their name, and I included uh, some of their reasons for that, but I will invite them back, so okay. the schedules must have changed. And let me go and get Chris. He was coughing. I really, I sent Heather a note, and I'm like, I gotta go look for Chris. I was afraid he was out. So I'm really excited. He first came, he brought his cough medicine, and yes. so he yes. got here with him. Yeah, it's like yeah. Pharmacy is <laughs> <laughs> All right, but first, but first, public comment. <laughs> Man. Okay. Chris, you're on. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Expenses. Yep, just give me one second. I just sure. have to uh, go back to the page. So we do have the expense report. Um, through the end of last week, a um, couple of items to note in it, and that is that I haven't transferred any of, you'll see that um, accounts that are over budget are basically in the sped tuition accounts, um, and that is because we still haven't gotten the approval for the 240 grant, so I can't transfer those expenses over to that grant. So, you know, the negative balances of, um, Quite sure what they were here. Um, 163,000 and 52,000 dollars. Those are not anything that we need to be worried about. Um, as we get approval for the grants, we'll transfer the expenses over. That will bring them back up into you know where they need to be. Um, really, not a heck of a lot else um, to report with the expenses. There's there's nothing unusual other than the grants. Um, Although it really doesn't show up here, um, just an, another heads up would be that the para salaries right now still have the Hadley kids. Um, the people that work for Hadley kids in the afternoon are going to that line until we get everything transferred over to us and then we'll transfer those expenses over. So we're tracking that. 
it's around five thousand dollars or so so it's again it's not really something that's going to show up but those expenses will come out of here as well um, you know when we're set up for that um, other than that that's really about all I have to uh, to highlight. I don't know if anyone has any questions. I was going to ask you about the fuel, oil, and gas, and whether are we at the time of year where you lock in that price, or are we beyond that? I locked it in um, March, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We typically lock it in um, during the budget season. Yep. Um, we can start locking it in right on January second, and uh, you know it's. It's anybody's guess when the best price is going right. to be, but um, right now our price is looking good. So, uh, you know, it's certainly nice that we have it locked in. And the good thing about it is that you don't have to worry then, you know, about, oh my God, the oil price is going up. And, right. you know, yeah. how are we going to pay for it? <coughs> um, let's see here. Next we have the revolving report. And you'll notice the. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. The positive balance in the lunch account. Um, it's good. So there may be some slight revisions to these balances. Um, the town should be working on rolling over um, the accounts from last year um, in, into FY20 right around now. I know they're working on the uh, free cash certification, so that goes along with it. Um, but there, there won't be anything major. What I did was I took basically where we were in June. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, and applied any expenses to it to come up with these figures. Um, for the preschool, you can see we don't usually have this issue, but there have been no revenues posted yet um, at all in FY20, and obviously we have revenues coming in. So um, you know, rather than show kind of a, a fake twenty-five thousand dollar negative balance when we know that there are revenues that are supposed to have been posted. I just kind of left those out, um, and I, I think once they get the free cash certified, then they'll get caught up on all of this, and we'll have it back to uh, you know how we normally are. And then we'll start seeing after school on this report. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can add that, um, you know, as one of the yeah. columns as well. Sure. Okay. We did get some reports today with the revenues that um, that were coming in, and um, you know, once we once we get the account set up. Then we'll be able to go in and actually, you know, log in and get the information ourselves. So we have our revenues through October and have the kids right now are posted as twenty-seven thousand nine hundred and two. Mm -hmm. To Chris's point, that's still sitting in Park and Rec software, yeah. and um, we're projected. Right now, our projections would indicate that we would absolutely be in the black at the end of the year. Um, next up is the and just oh. can I just say with sure. school choice just some good predictions around school choice in terms of our numbers mm -hmm. we won't know exactly until our October 1 count is um, certified but if you look at our June school choice receiving right so in June school choice receiving <coughs> we ended with 94.6 students point six means somebody came mid-year right we had six students graduate and our new school choice enrolled our um, 23 students. So if I assume, assume that we retained, which is a big assumption, we assume we retained everyone in that, um, we're looking at about 112 students. So we won't have that certified for a bit, but that does, that is great. And on June 19, June of 2019, we were, uh, that was school choice receiving I just gave you, we were sending about 61 students. Um, at that 94.6, that was, uh, the revenue from that was $735,639. And so we could be potentially as high as 112 kids in school choice, which would be That's nice. It would be the nice. highest we've seen in a long time. Yeah, really Again, I got it. We don't know that until we see all the shuffling that happens with who goes out and who goes in. And that'll happen in a couple months. Yep, December is when we get December the December is when we get the report. The updated amount. Is there any, um, just a question, I'll look at that, and any um, follow-up with parents of the school choice of children to see if like, they 
the outreach and stuff helped get more people in? It's yeah, so in, in terms of getting people in, um, some of the things that parents have commented on is Hadley Elementary School has started doing the same shadowing that Hopkins Academy does. I got very positive feedback from parents around that, that they like shadowing, they like visiting, they like the time with the principal. That has been effective at Hadley Elementary School. At Hopkins Academy, I often share with you what parents say after those visits, even when parents don't or families don't choose Hopkins Academy. Um, they are very complimentary. Uh, the welcome that they get from Mr. Beck, from the front office, from the teachers, and they're extremely happy with the student ambassadors that when we do these shadows, the students <coughs> that are assigned, I'm not sure how the students are selected, but um, that's, we get really positive feedback about that. In terms of leaving, we do still track those data. The primary reason, stated reason, Sometimes it's moving, so you move and you know, they just transportation becomes an issue um, in terms of people leaving the district. Sometimes transportation becomes an issue and families can't sustain school choice with private transportation. And um, in general, not just school choice, but in general, leaving the district, if it isn't a geographical move, it is um, program offerings, which uh, in some cases means athletics. Can't come out and say that. That's what it means. Thank you, Doug. Sure. <coughs> um, so next we have the grant report. Um, I have to apologize because at the very last minute I said, "Oh, I need to add in the Safer Schools and Communities grant." So I inserted a row and added it in, but for some reason it was not included in the formulas. So you can see how. We used about $21,000 of that grant, and the grant total is zero. So um, that's my error. I apologize for that. Um, but if I can just go through them quickly. So Title Title II and uh, Title I and Title IV, those are um, made up basically of teacher salaries with some uh, psychologists as well. So I will be transferring expenses over to those throughout the year. I, I do them in... in Kind of large chunks but they don't like us to um, to use the grants too quickly um, you know we get a warning when I put in for drawdowns that oh you've used more than 25 percent of the grant and it's too soon so you know I you got to kind of spread those out a little bit as I mentioned the 240 and the 262 are the two sped grants that we haven't gotten the approval for yet so um, you know those will obviously um, get transfers once we receive them the 391 is the preschool um, that pays for preschool salaries. And again, you know, because all of these were just approved, we didn't transfer anything over to them yet. I usually do two transfers through the year, um, and I try to do it relatively quickly with that because these, these are the kind of grants that would get cut. And this grant was scheduled to be cut this year, and somehow we luckily got one more year. Everybody was expecting it to get cut out, and... Um, Last year was supposed to be the last year, and now they gave us one more. So those grants I, I will use more quickly because what I've found is that when you use them, if they cut it during mid-year and you've already used it, they kind of just shrug and say, well, what can we do? You know, So you keep the money. Um, if you haven't spent that, it yet, then they say, okay, well, now instead of $30,000, you are going to get twenty five or something. So we tend to jump on that a little bit. Um, the safer schools one that uh, we the twenty one thousand was to change um, locks in this building. Uh, we have some other security upgrades. I don't really want to talk about those in open session, but um, all of these grants will be used in their entirety, like they are every year. We never uh, send back anything with the grants. We spend them right down to zero, so um, they will be as well this year. And next month you'll also see, because Chris just got it for me, the $15,000 that we received from the governor for the Innovation Pathway Planning and $30,000 for Early College High School Planning. Is Circuit Breaker also expected to be higher next year? Oh, <coughs> news. I just because of the um, funding. What, uh, or is so it the amount you can carry over? No, it's that they will allow in the new funding formula, which will take effect next year, Correct. Some parts of it, uh, we would be allowed to charge currently that circuit breaker reimbursement. We only get to look at four times foundation for the cost of tuition. 
we will be allowed in the new formula to include special education transportation costs, which is a huge win um, because the cost of a bus, depending on how many students are going, so a tuition could be as as a tuition could be as low as thirty-eight thousand dollars. A tuition could be fifty thousand dollars, and a bus um, could be. 1836, uh, $54,000 easily. So $300 a day could be a bus. So not being able, to, in some cases, the bus cost was as much, if not more, than the tuition. Now we can include that in circuit breaker reimbursement. It is huge. So, Andy, you mm -hmm. joked earlier about the thousands <coughs> of grants. It'd be helpful, I think, for me and the public if there was a list of, you know, bulletized list of you know, description. <coughs> Sure. The that you've, you've been awarded. Sure. And, and you've done a great job. Kidding. Thank you. I'm happy for many of the things, so I can certainly include that. I'll probably include that in December since we have such a short meeting in November. Um, and then I can talk to the public about it. We did, as I've said, I'm very disappointed, but I'm hopeful for next time. We did not get awarded the U.S. Department of, Ed of Education Federal Award. Uh, $750,000 over five years it kills me every time I say that, but I'm, I'm going for it again. I will get it or die because <laughs> I won't quit on that grant. And uh, we also found out we did not get the U.S. Department of Justice. I don't know, as I shared with you on the Department of Ed grant, I felt very good about our first attempt, and I feel like I feel very confident that we will be successful in the future. Department of Justice does not give you the rubrics back, so I have no idea how well we did, but we'll try again. What was the DOJ grant? It was predominantly, <coughs> I feel bad because I really wanted this for police and fire. The biggest expense in that would have provided additional personnel support for police and fire. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there also were some additional safety upgrades for the schools, um, but we'll, I'll try again. If nothing else, we learned how to navigate the uh, yeah. online application process, which was We're really good at that. Unbelievable. <laughs> That's a feat <beat> itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and it's pretty amazing that we have like very in-depth feedback on one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes I uh, find, and this is in other mm -hmm. disciplines and other areas, that um, the the uh, politics around the current administration and the the blue nature of our state sometimes has something to do with it. And, you know, oftentimes grants can be out of the control of even the best grant writers. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm, I'd like to think that that's not the case in, mm -hmm. as it relates to education and our district. Um, but sometimes, sometimes it's uh, helpful to understand what the background is. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I'm just, I'm going to keep trying. And I do feel very good about that. Um, try going after that big grant, the, the multi-year, almost million dollar award grant, so we'll keep at it. And we do have some exciting things underway. There was a part of me that was somewhat relieved when we didn't get those other two, because we have been funded for a number of other things, so um, I will provide that update in December. Okay. Okay. And then an overview of the um, upcoming town meeting, um, capital request for the special town meeting. This was just to remind folks of what's on for school committee. Uh, we are in Article 3. That's, mm -hmm. that's just adjusting our borrowing downward. We didn't use <coughs> everything for the school HVAC. Um, and then in Article 5, that's where you see the school parking lot. That is borrowing within the levy. Um, the school bus, $120,000. And the school IT upgrades at $100,000. Um, that would require, require debt exclusion. And so if it is passed on town meeting floor, so it's going to require, what does that mean? Two-thirds on town meeting floor? I'm going to mess this up. Two-thirds and, and, two the and then the ballot, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so it has to first pass two-thirds town meeting, and then it will have to go to ballot. And then IT uh, is a couple of years worth of IT. That's right. The finance committee decided to combine this year and next year's. Correct. And with some good feedback from um, Tara, uh, David Olson, the IT director, put together kind of an analysis that we will include with the posters and the table and the binder explaining everything. Um, I'll also put something in the weekly update that will forward that detail out to people in the community about what's included in that IT request. Um, and David also will be there to answer questions. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, 
I know that future topics involve the um, the locker room and the mm -hmm. univents, but I have to say at the forum, the poster display and information that was up, it looked so incredible. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. I, yeah, I did well send, send D and Sue a note, but it was just very informative and to have the visuals to be able to explain it visually and show mm -hmm. where where the ask is going yeah, was really helpful. Yeah. So that was 100% everything that was put together in the original packet. Chris put all of that together. The posters were 100% uh, D, Rex, and Suki, so they did a great job. Because you know me, if it's not an Excel spreadsheet, <laughs> it can't get me interested. So I didn't do those. There were no bar charts. There were no bar charts. <laughs> that was my yes. work. Well, thank you, Chris, too, sure, for yes. the information. Yeah. All right, and so November 7th, yes, annual town meeting. Mm -hmm. Please come out. Mm -hmm. OK. Anything else? Oh, yes, we have the additional warrant approval topic. Yes. Um, so last month we talked about uh, whether we would be willing to go forward with having one electronic approver um, as being the approver, approver of the um, accounts payable warrant and the payroll warrants with all of us having access the way that we get our um, notifications now, but Chris being able to put in really who's the one person that once they approve it, it triggers right, the, yeah. the movement to go forward. Yeah, what happens is the town won't release the checks until we get all the signatures. I can't send over a, a partially signed warrant or anything like that. So, um, and I'm not I'm not complaining, but at the same time, I, I get it. You know, we're, we're actually looking at the same thing on the Ware School Committee, where it's just hard to get everybody in to sign these. Um, and uh, so <clears throat> we're going to reduce it in where to down to the one that the law requires. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would ask that we do the same thing here because we want to just get these checks out. You know, when when I'm waiting on signatures, the checks are sitting at the town hall, and the unfortunate thing is then we receive another bill. Um, you know, sometimes with a finance charge on it, which we certainly don't want. Um, and we we typically call them and just say, hey, you know, it's it's the warrant process, you know, it, it, payment is, is um, on its way, and they they typically waive the uh, the service charge, but, you know, again, it, it would just make for a, a kind of a smoother bill paying process if we can just <coughs> get the bill and get these checks out as quickly as possible, so, um, you know, I don't know how everybody feels about it, everybody would still have access to view, um, you know, as it stands right now, we have three people that are signers, and two more members that are viewers. So we kind of go to one member as a signer and four members of viewers. Everybody would still be able to see it. Um, just, you know, looking to kind of streamline the process. So I think two things. One, whether this sounds okay, and two, whether um, there's any volunteers from the three signers as to who wants to be the one signer, if one person is interested. <coughs> I had no concern with it, just because there's still visibility. Right. Um, and obviously all of the hard copy stuff, I mean, the, the meat behind it is also available. Usually, isn't that in the district office? We need mm -hmm. it. Yeah, we need it now. But otherwise, I, um, I think that as long as we have, still have the visibility and insight into it, I'm comfortable. Yeah. Do you that? I know that um, my, just mentioned to Paul, my responsibilities are increasing. Uh, and I, I think I've been not a bottleneck necessarily, but I don't want to sign up for more and find out that I end, end up being a bottleneck. So I'd like not to be the one of the three. Okay. Any volunteers from the remaining two? If I'm fast enough for you, I'm happy to. What's that? If I'm fast enough, I know I'm not always, and you have to remind me occasionally. But if I'm fast enough, or if you want to do it, good. I think I have to be reminded virtually every single time. So, okay. um, <laughs> I don't I think I'm that bad, no offense. <laughs> you my good days and bad days. I was going to say, Tara, given your yeah. upcoming uh, yeah. delivery, are you comfortable? I mean, yeah, I'll still be on my email. I'm going to be at home 24 7. Trust me, I'll probably be faster when I'm on the Like, who got something for me to do? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Do we um, need to vote? Yeah. For, okay. So we have a motion um, to uh, put a single approver on AP and payroll warrants, and the approver being um, Tara. So moved. 
Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Sure. Thank you. All right. Thank you. School committee reports. We got it. School committee reports. Okay, so policy. Yeah. Our uh, first meeting um, uh, earlier this evening, first one in a while, and uh, went through a series of policies right. that you will see for first reading next um, school committee meeting mm -hmm. in November. So we're on this cycle of meeting an hour before the school committee meetings. And I thought that worked pretty well. I thought it worked great. Yeah. Anxiously await that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yay. I'm not going to leave until I see it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Um, Sarah, start time task force. So we had our first meeting last week. It was virtual, which actually worked out quite well, mm -hmm. um, technology-wise. And so um, we've kind of looked into the areas of focus that we want to start um, kind of dividing and conquering the work. So by the time we come back for our next meeting, we're all going to have an idea of kind of the questions that we want to ask and um, talk with key stakeholders about kind of each gaining questions and insight and information, but kind of the collection of data um, phase between different groups. <clears throat> and then some people will be continuing on, sorry, my voice, will be continuing on with um, research as well, just kind of looking into that. So we've all kind of divided and conquered up tasks. Okay. How big is the group? There's six people. Nice. Yeah, a parent yeah. rep from each building. And That's good. Student. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. It's a good exciting. Group. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. group getting that off the ground. Awesome. Okay, finance tri-board. Um, my only update is in regards to the forum um, that we did attend, that there were no uh, specific questions about the um, capital items. There was a question about um, the establishment of the how the kids, mm -hmm. the accepting of the funds, and just how much that was, and that was really it. So, um, so it was a good uh, overall, I think, um, environment and a lot of information for people there. Um, but no additional. I have not met with the tri board since our last meeting. Fields and CPA. Conservation Commission approved the plans for the fields. Yay! Yeah. Uh, Berkshire yeah. Design did a great job. Mm -hmm. We got an extension uh, for the. First round of CPA funds, is it? We don't, I don't think we need one. We need so any other expense because David, David said we'd started to expand yeah. it, so mm -hmm. we're putting that window. Excellent. And that had been communicated to yep. Andy. Yes. Thank you. Great. Congrats. So the next steps are? Uh, we sent an email today requesting uh, Berkshire Design to put together, so we've asked Berkshire Design to put together the bid specifications. We're looking to find out when, we, when they think those will be finished, and then we'll um, Advertise and award. So that's really when the truth comes comes to pay, right? We'll find yes. out how much how much yes. it is. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. It's exciting. Well, it's yeah. Good. Congrats for getting it to us. Yeah. 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 Team. team effort, definitely. Thank you. Excellent. All right, and finally, Camara uh, Collaborative. Yeah. So I <coughs> the uh, September twenty fifth. Uh, collaborative board meeting and uh, most of the meeting was dedicated to um, uh, the evaluation of the executive director which by law they have to do every year mm -hmm. and if you think our evaluation annually is a lift boy this organization spans multiple millions lots of objectives serves so many different school districts it's it's incredible um, so anyways, that was a big focus of that meeting, and everything was approved, um, as, as we all thought it would be, because they're doing really great work. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that did come out of that is that there are two um, districts that are um, requesting membership, and by law, um, CES is required to um, get, I think it's a two-thirds majority of its school committees to vote on those two districts being allowed to be members. Mm -hmm. And so Bill has requested that he attend one of the upcoming school committee meetings, I think it's in November, mm -hmm. to um, possibly update us briefly on how mm -hmm. you know the work of CES is going, but also to seek our approval of that. Of course, with any additional member um, district, that's additional income that helps bring down the cost mm -hmm. of the services that we do enjoy. And so we'd like to see that happen. Mm -hmm. That's great. You know, in advance of him coming in November, just to tie in with um, Jack's topic, I'd be interested 
Remember they came a few years ago and kind of gave a list of the types of shared services, topics, you know, areas that they had. And I can't remember whether there was anything on, you know, environmental footprint and just anything on there as far as services, uh, resources, information that might, we might be able to tap into. I can't remember either, but um, I can't tell you it came up at the superintendent's meeting at the collective, right. so they are uh, asking for feedback from superintendents about interest in this area, at which point I volunteered two students to go uh, work at the collaborative, <laughs> unbeknownst to the two students. <laughs> uh, and they were very interested in potentially having student representatives regionally. You do have the right, of course, to say no to whatever <laughs> craziness. I mean, you did ask me about this. I, I think I actually might have committed you to a couple things, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yes, so they are moving this direction and they're very eager to have some of our students perhaps lead the work of organizing a lot of students around us. So it did just come up at the superintendent's meeting. What I'll ask Bill is if he's comfortable and can <coughs> share, maybe he could give a little bit of an update on maybe what other districts are doing in this area mm -hmm. and also what CES is thinking about doing in supporting these districts. That would be really helpful. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Anything else? That's it? Okay. All right. Um, our remaining action items are approval of the warrants. Um, is there a motion to approve the AP warrants that were submitted in September 2019? So approved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I will abstain. Uh, is there a motion to approve the uh, payroll warrants submitted in September 2019? So, second, second. Some <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. We did this for special plans, job description, after school, um, and so, 191, the minutes, approval of the September 23rd, 2019 minutes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. And our next meeting, um, a little different date, and. Uh, we're meeting November 20th, mm -hmm. which is a Wednesday? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, at 5.30. I'm assuming that will be here? Yep. Okay. Any um, concerns with that date? Um, this is the 20th at? 5.30. 5.30, yeah. It's a Wednesday afternoon. Um, I know it sounds like two of the topics we'll have is the um, student group uh, GSA mm -hmm. and the collaborative of Bill Dale here, and that's, should we add more things? Well, it'll be pretty short, because we have one hour period, because Start Time Task Force right. meets that night, so i got to get home to get on Google um, and do that. And uh, So you will have CES, you will approve Hartsbrook, if I have their occupancy certificate. Uh, Bill, and we'll award two students, the uh, three students, the NASDAQ and NASS awards. Oh, great. Great, and, and there will be a policy meeting at 4.30 on that day. Yep. My only note about the 20th is that Mr. Fazio had um, expressed interest in moving Jazz Band an hour earlier because okay. he lives an hour away, so he, sure. um, it's a very long drive for him, but it's currently at 6.30, so that would be moved up we to 5.30. Yeah, well, then we can meet somewhere else. Yeah, we can meet yeah. 109, but I didn't know that for things. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Fazio. He had just bounced the idea off of us, but... I mean, yeah, it's not a big deal. And you can actually tell even if it says that we're using it, we can move on. Okay, I'll let you hear her comment. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much.